Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, punishment without trial, an important subject and also the title of a new and tremendously important book by our guest, Carissa Byrne Hessick, who is the Ranzel Distinguished Professor of Law at the University of North Carolina School of Law, where she also serves as the director of the Prosecutors and Politics Project. Before joining the faculty at the University of North Carolina, she taught at the law schools of Arizona State, Harvard, and the University of Utah. Her work on the criminal justice system has been published by the LA Times, Philadelphia Inquirer, Slate, and numerous academic journals. Carissa Byrne Hessick, welcome to Talk World Radio. Thanks so much for having me on. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for writing this book. Um, I have had guests on this show before where I started out with, so explain to people why people falsely confess to crimes. Uh, I don't know how what percentage of the public is still mystified by that, but your answer is a little bit different and goes to a big, major, fundamental problem with uh, with law in this country. Can you explain a little bit? Sure, I'd be happy to. So I think um, for the people who get their information about the criminal justice system from popular culture, from watching TV or movies, they would think that most uh, criminal cases are resolved with a trial in a courtroom and a jury. But that really couldn't be further than the truth. Um, Fewer than 3% of people who are convicted of committing a crime get a trial. The rest of them plead guilty. They say that they committed the crime, and they do it because we've set up a system that's designed to, to pressure them into saying that they committed a crime. Um, sometimes they did actually commit that crime, but sometimes they didn't. And we don't have a different system for people who we suspect might be innocent. We just have the same system for everyone. And the result is that is, is that sometimes um, innocent ple people plead guilty. But the other result of it is it's actually pretty cheap and easy for us to convict people. And so we do it a lot. And we send lots and lots and lots of people to prison with great regularity. So, so part of the answer is, is the threat of hugely severe punishment if you go to trial and anything goes wrong, right? And yeah, that's the threat for people who are accused of serious crimes. For people who are accused of less serious crimes, and they're actually much, much more of that. There's something like 13 million misdemeanor cases every year and a million felony cases, the felony cases being the more serious cases. For the misdemeanor uh, defendants, uh, the pressure works out differently, uh, sometimes because they can't make bail, and so they're sitting in jail, and they'll take a plea bargain just to be able to go home because the plea bargain will be to time served, or other times because they'll have to come back to trial half a dozen or a dozen times in order to actually get their day in court. And so it's it's sort of it would be irrational for them to keep coming back and missing work and paying for parking and all of those things just to get a you know two hundred dollar fine off their record. So it it depends on the sort of case, but for the serious cases, the the cases that the that the listeners probably think about when they think about the criminal justice system, you're right. It's the pressure. Um, associated with the fact that they'll be subject to much, much, much longer sentences if they decide to go to trial and they're convicted at trial. And so part of the problem is this that you describe in the book is this whole system that people probably don't think of when they think of incarceration, pre-trial, pre-conviction, pre-guilty of anything, uh, incarceration uh, and uh, the influence you describe of a $2 billion a year bail industry on that. Yeah, it's, um, it's something that I think when people hear about bail, it only gets framed as a public safety issue. So we saw this, for example, in New York recently, where the state changed its bail laws, and then police officers and others went to the papers to say this has made the public less safe. They claimed that um, the uptick in crime was associated with the change in bail laws because they weren't able to keep dangerous people in prison. And then um, folks did an investigation. The New York Post, which is hardly a liberal paper, uh, looked into these claims and found that the police were just 
I don't know if they were lying because I don't know if they knew what they were saying was wrong, but they were wrong. Um, the people who were committing these new crimes weren't out on bail. They hadn't been arrested yet in part probably because police are actually um, not very good at solving crimes. The statistics of solving crimes for police is, is really kind of awful. Um, you know, uh, an awful lot of crimes that get committed never get solved. But people were so scared that um, there had been an increase in violence because of the change in the bail law that then Governor Andrew Cuomo and others pushed through a late night change to make the bail laws much harsher again, to make it so that a lot of people who've only been accused of a crime, they haven't been found guilty, are sitting in jail. And the conditions in jail, I'm sure you can imagine, David, are horrible. I mean, people get um, violently attacked by other people in jail. Um, the, the, the food and the, the conditions are horrible. They can't see their families. They lose their jobs. Um, those conditions pressure them to plead guilty. So you have people caught up in a system acting out of fear, encouraged to act out of fear. And then you have politicians sitting in their comfortable chairs in air conditioned offices acting out of fear as well, which we is well known not to encourage, uh, intelligent thought. Um, but but your analysis, Carissa Bernhesek, your analysis is that the problem is is the lack of trials uh, and the rampant use of of plea bargains. Uh, that in fact there's a fundamental right to trial that's being uh, being violated and neglected here. That's right. There's, I mean, the, the right to a jury trial actually appears twice in the Constitution, and yet it's being flouted every day. And I think. Um, Something that people probably don't appreciate is the system that we've built, all of the procedures that we have, and our way of trying to get at the truth is built around the idea of a trial. Criminal defendants, if they go to trial, they have a fair number of procedural protections, but those don't kick in unless a trial actually starts. So by shifting all of our focus to plea bargaining, we've sort of fundamentally warped the system. We've encouraged lawmakers to enact harsher and harsher sentences, specifically to give prosecutors more leverage in the plea bargaining process. But we've also never come up with any alternative to the trial to make sure that we're actually sorting the, Guinness, the innocent from the guilty. It's like, imagine we had a system where um, we were going to test the safety of products for consumers, like cars. We were going to have people do um, crash tests to see if cars were safe. And then we stopped doing the crash tests, but didn't adopt any other system in its place to decide whether the cars are safe or not, except maybe the gut feeling of the people who were supposed to be involved in the testing. And they could say, well, look, I've done a lot of these tests, and so I have a pretty good sense about whether the car will stand up or not. But then over time, they conduct fewer and fewer tests, and there's turnover in the sort of in the people who would be conducting the tests until they've maybe conducted just a handful of tests every year. But they're saying these cars are safe, and we're putting them out on the road, and we know that at least some of them get into horrific car wrecks, and people are killed, and yet we don't change our system because the new system is more efficient. Or because you've got a culture that's persuaded everybody that any car that's manufactured is by definition safe the, in the way that many people in the so-called justice system currently think anyone accused is necessarily guilty. Uh, and, and you describe in, in the book lawyers and prosecutors negotiating sentences picking crimes out of a book that have nothing to do with uh, anything that the accused might even have been suspected of committing, but to pick a crime with a sentence that both sides can agree on. So truth is just out the window, right? That's right, David. We've convinced ourselves that this is more efficient, and what we'll do is we'll let the parties negotiate over everything. So a claim of innocence isn't something that we send to, you know, neutral decision makers like a jury. Instead, it's just one more thing to bargain over. And if the claim of innocence seems strong, the person might get a better deal. But it's really up to the prosecutor whether to go forward with these cases or not. And the truth is, 
case, prosecutors are really overburdened. Defense attorneys, too, they don't have the time to conduct the sort of investigations and testing of evidence that we would see if these cases went to trial. So they're they're bargaining, but they're doing it very quickly, and they're doing it with really limited information. It's... Um, it, to see how the sausage is made in the system, that this is what we're doing with people's innocence and with people's freedom is really disturbing. And, and we don't see it as part of the problem, right? It's not a public trial on the record. It's backroom, secret, unaccountable dealing for, for bargains. That's right. So the public doesn't know that sometimes people will plead guilty because the prosecutor has said, well, you committed this crime in your home, so maybe we should charge the other members of your family. As you might imagine, that is going to pressure people to plead guilty very quickly, but people rarely see it happen. In fact, that was something that came up in the prosecution of Michael Flynn, right? Donald Trump's former national security advisor. It became clear from the documents filed in that case that as part of his agreement to plead guilty, as part of his plea bargain, Michael Flynn got the government to say that they wouldn't pursue criminal charges against his son, who was supposedly wrapped up in some of the things that Michael Flynn had been doing. Now, I am not one of these people who thinks that Michael Flynn is an innocent man who was accused, who was falsely accused of a crime and there was this big government cover-up. But I can tell you that if somebody accused my kid of a crime and said that if I pleaded guilty, they wouldn't go after my kid, I'd plead guilty, yeah. even if I were innocent. Yeah. And, and whether the, the son was guilty or innocent uh, is not actually relevant to the question of whether the father was guilty or innocent, right? It's uh, right. Um, the, it, this, this plea bargaining, this domination of the U.S. justice system with plea bargaining is not actually uh, original. It's not been there since the 1780s. This is something that's just about exactly 50 years old or so. And, and yeah, the history of plea bargaining is really murky, David, um, in part because it was it was conducted in secret because people didn't think it was OK. We do know that there are records of people pleading guilty, um, even back in England before the colonists came over to the United States, but it was frowned upon and judges would try to talk them out of pleading guilty because they didn't, they, among other things, they wanted to make sure that the person wasn't being pressured into pleading guilty. So yes, there were guilty pleas at the beginning of, uh, of the United States. Um, but the idea that the prosecutors would negotiate with the defendants, um, that we don't know exactly when it started. There's one book that found a couple of examples of it in Massachusetts back in the early 1800s. But the sense is, to the extent it happened, it was rare. And if it happened, it happened in secret. And when it came to light, um, most judges would say, you can't do this. You can't strike these sorts of bargains. The prosecutor is not supposed to have this power. And it was really only in sort of the early 20th century that we found out how widespread the practice was. And it was only in the early 1970s that the Supreme Court actually said it was okay, that it wasn't unconstitutional for prosecutors to do this, even if what they were doing was threatening to send defendants to jail for longer for insisting on their constitutional right to a trial. It's, it's a very odd how blatant a violation it seems of what's in the Constitution. The right, I mean, if, if I were to suggest that corporations don't have human rights or my neighbor doesn't have a right to a machine gun, I'd, I'd be in big trouble, right? But here you have the right to a jury trial, the right to a speedy jury trial. And, and in your book, you show states passing laws to charge defendants fees if they ask for a jury trial. And one guy suspected three times of incompetency to stand trial precisely because he wanted to stand trial. And that's crazy. Uh, <laughs> 
it's crazy because but it's 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 literally irrational to insist on going to trial if the evidence against you is strong because we know how much longer you you'll end up spending in jail i mean there was a a report recently that was released by the national association of criminal defense lawyers they were able to get a bunch of data from the federal system to show that on average people who insisted on going to trial and were convicted served sentences that were three times longer than the, than than comparable people who who pleaded guilty and you're right to think that this doesn't make any constitutional sense we have a lot of other areas where if people are threatened that they'll lose something for exercising their constitutional rights the Supreme Court steps in and says, no, you can't do that. In fact, um, people thought that these cases were going to um, blow up plea bargaining. There was a, a case right around when the Supreme Court decided that plea bargaining was okay, where a defendant had been convicted and thought there was something wrong with his trial. And so he appealed that conviction saying that the judge had made a mistake. And he won on appeal. So then he got sent back down to the same judge to have a new trial and he got convicted again and the judge imposed a longer sentence and he appealed and he said, well, that's not fair. It seems like I'm getting punished for exercising my constitutional right to an appeal. And the Supreme Court said, yeah, it sure does. And they, you know, judges can't do that. We don't want them to scare people from exercising their constitutional right to an appeal. So when a defendant came along, a defendant from Kentucky, where the prosecutor had threatened him and said, if you don't plead guilty, I'm going to bring new charges that will make you spend your entire life in prison. And the defendant said, well, that must be unconstitutional. It's just like that case with the appeal. And the Supreme Court said, no, it's not. And the only reason that they gave David was a few years before they had said plea bargaining is constitutional and plea bargaining is not going to work if prosecutors can't threaten defendants. And so therefore this must be constitutional too. That's literally what they said. It's the most shocking thing that you could imagine. They said, well, we don't want people really exercising this constitutional right. So we're going to have to abandon what we would ordinarily say is necessary to protect that right. Or the greater good of plea bargaining, which isn't in the constitution. Uh, the, the book, which every everybody should read is Punishment Without Trial by our guest, Carissa Byrne Hessick. Um, what, what shocked me in this book was uh, the number of parts of the system that seemed designed to uphold the practice of plea bargaining rather than for any other purpose. So law, uh, harsh sentencing laws, mandatory minimums designed, explicitly designed not to deter or prevent crime, but to keep the plea bargaining system working, right? That's right. Several years ago, there was a push to change the, the mandatory minimum sentences for drugs in the federal system, which are really high, so much higher than they are in most states. And so a, number, a, a group of bipartisan senators decided they should lower those sentences because it didn't seem appropriate to put people who had relatively um, – small quantities of drugs uh, in jail for that long. And they pointed out that a number of a number of defendants who get convicted under these laws, they're not kingpins, they're like drug mules who get paid next to nothing to help move these drugs. So there was a push to change the laws. Um, it came up for a hearing in the Senate Judiciary Committee. And Senator Chuck Grassley said, oh no, we shouldn't change these laws. If you look at the statistics, most of the people who are subject to this mandatory minimum plead guilty to a different crime and serve a shorter sentence. And they do that and they cooperate with the prosecutors to help go out and catch more bad guys. And he's like, that's exactly what we want. The, 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 the laws are working as intended. It's not that people are going to jail for this amount of time. It's that they're being pressured to plead guilty and help prosecutors. So the very person whose responsibility it's supposed to be in our constitutional system to listen to his constituents and say what the appropriate punishments are said, let's set the punishment higher so that people will feel pressure to plead guilty. <laughs> I'd like to see statistics on the number of times Senator Grassley have listened to his constituents. Um, there, are, uh, there, there are also endless examples of additional rights being lost in this process. So prosecutors uh, in cases in your book can deny 
evidence can deny discovery of information known to them to the defense in order to get a plea, uh, in order to make a bargain. They can offer a plea bargain on condition that you not get a lawyer at all. Uh, they can take your money, uh, seize your property, and use it in the bargaining to get a plea. Uh, I mean, how many how many rights are being lost in the name of upholding plea bargaining? Well, the, the problem, as you've identified, David, is that plea bargaining isn't limited to the right to a jury trial. The Supreme Court has said they're not going to involve themselves in the bargains that prosecutors are going to strike. And that's why prosecutors are, are free to put anything they want in that agreement. They can say, you know, you have to agree not only to waive your right to a jury trial, but also to waive your right to an appeal or the right to see discovery or the right to sue the police officer who obviously beat you within an inch of your life using excessive force that would entitle you to a damages award of money. We're going to make you waive that right. And in fact, um, there's reason to believe that this is a common tactic, that when police officers brutalize citizens, um, it gets swept under the rug because the people who are beaten by police are told, we'll agree not to file criminal charges against you if you will agree to not bring a lawsuit against the police or the city who've done this. And so there's reason to think that plea bargaining insulates bad behavior from police, not just in terms of beating people, but also in terms of illegal searches or even illegal arrests. People who are facing the possibility that they might get indicted, that they might face criminal charges, may be willing to forego their other rights just to avoid the threat of punishment. Well, the obvious uh, question to play devil's advocate here that I think a number of people are going to ask is if the courts are overloaded now with 3% of the cases, how do you get them to have trials for 100%? Don't you need uh, a society that's more humane and just with less poverty and less crime and, and fewer prosecutions? Don't you need a society where the accused can suspect that the jury might be fair to them, might not be eager to recklessly convict, that where where a defendant can even find a lawyer who doesn't assume that he or she is is guilty because accused. Don't you need don't you need some major institutional and cultural reforms in a whole sort of package uh, if you're gonna do this? Definitely. I at the end of the book, I offer some solutions, some suggestions for reform. And what I don't say is I don't say get rid of plea bargaining, because the truth is there are too many other problems with the system that if we did get rid of plea bargaining, what we would end up with is even more people in jail because we have the really harsh sentences, for example. Um, I don't say that we should get rid of plea bargaining because the truth is when I interviewed, because um, I interviewed a lot of people for this book, when I would interview defense attorneys, many of whom were angry about the plea bargaining system, they also said that was the only way that they could get some leniency for their clients, right? They would have a client who had you know, suffered uh, in poverty or with terrible substance abuse addictions, and they would say, plea bargaining is a way for us to get a better deal for our clients and maybe get them back on the right path. So that said, though, I do think that as a society, we need to grapple with the fact that we've decided to criminalize so many things that we can't possibly give people a fair trial. I mean, the 13 million misdemeanors a year that I mentioned before, that's something that we should care about. When people are asked whether they're concerned about crime and they say yes, which I completely understand, they're not thinking about those 13 million misdemeanors. They're thinking about those felonies and we're giving short shrift to those serious crimes because of all of the low level crimes that we've decided to enact. That's really something that we should revisit as a society, whether the criminal justice system is the right tool to deal with social disorder or whether we should use other tools like social safety nets, for example, to try 
to deal with the disorder that we see on the yeah. streets. And, and whether it's counterproductive on its own terms in generating recidivism rather than keeping people out of the system, a system which you describe in a very interesting chapter in the book as part of the punishment. That is, people are taking plea bargains just so they don't have to take time off work to show up eight different times for horrible not just boring, but dehumanizing process uh, in the system, right? That's right. It's really awful. Uh, this was an insight um, from a researcher uh, back in the 1960s and 70s who sat in a courtroom in New Haven. Malcolm Feely was his name, and he was there to observe trials. And then there were no trials. The whole time he was there, he sat there for a year. There were zero trials in his courtroom. So he started looking more generally at case processing, and he found that the way people are treated in these low-level cases, that's punishment too. They get, they have to come back in front of the judge multiple times. They're treated very poorly. Um, when I went uh, to go visit some courts in Brooklyn to do research for this book, I saw it. People were sitting for hours on these hard, not particularly clean benches, waiting for their names to be called. They weren't allowed to speak. They weren't allowed to eat. They weren't allowed to read. They had to just sit there. It was like being in detention, David. Um, they were being punished while waiting to talk to the judge about their case. And if that happens to you four or five times because of your poor decision to urinate in public, you've probably suffered more punishment than we think you ought to because the system itself puts you through that. So the system itself is really encouraging you to plead guilty. And, and I share your appropriate outrage at the ridiculous ban on reading while you're sitting bored to tears in a courtroom. We've got less than two minutes left. Carissa Byrne Hessek, where do you see a shot at progress? If there was a a petition from the public to somebody or somebody telling them to do something, what would it be? So this is going to sound so silly, David, because there's so much at stake for the people who uh, get indicted for those one million felonies every year. But I think the most good that we could do would be to address the 13 million misdemeanors. In fact, I think that if we could say that the defendants don't have to keep showing up in the courtroom, if they can just have their lawyers do that for them, and they're only required to be there if the case is going to go to trial, that could really change the dynamic in those cases. It could allow those people to keep working at their jobs and taking care of their families, and it wouldn't be disruptive for them. And prosecutors might actually decide it's not worth the candle to keep having these people come back again and and again, I did speak to a judge. I made this recommendation once before, and I got a phone call once from a judge saying, you know, I did that several years ago. Everyone was shocked. He's like, that's what we do for people in civil cases. Why wouldn't we afford the same dignity and humanity for people who are accused of a crime? Very interesting uh, suggestion. I highly recommend that everyone read this entire book and, and think about it and act on it uh, and start spreading these ideas. The book is called Punishment Without trial by our guest, Carissa Byrne Hessick, who is the Ransel Distinguished Professor of Law at the University of North Carolina School of Law, where she is also the director of the Prosecutors and Politics Project. Carissa, thank you very, very much for coming on Talk World Radio. Thank you, David. Yo, I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.